Okay, well, should we get um, get started? Just checking I'm not on mute, there we go. Um, so welcome um, to today's webinar and for joining us to hear about London's cost of living tracker. My name is Rebecca Roberts um, and I'm a grants manager at Trust for London. Um, and we're also joined by Nauko Skiada, who's Senior Data Insights Consultant and Guy Weir, Head of Data Insight at WPI Economics. Uh, Trust for London is an, in, uh, is an independent charitable foundation and our core mission is to support communities and organisations that are working to tackle poverty and inequality in London. And we fund frontline advice work, um, advocacy and people powered campaigns across the areas of housing, justice, employment, migrant rights, um, social security and living standards. And we also fund and commission research on poverty. So we work alongside WPI Economics to publish London's poverty profile, and it's a regularly updated online resource uh, with a range of different indicators to help us better understand the nature of poverty in the capital. Um, and we know that leading up to the pandemic, uh, for, for two decades, Lin London consistently had the highest uh, rate of poverty in the UK. And then we've been hit by COVID, followed by a cost of living crisis. Um, prior to 2020, millions of Londoners were already um, uh, experiencing high housing costs, poor quality homes and extortionate childcare, as well as low pay and poor working conditions. So jump forward to now, uh, we're confronted by rising costs, stagnating wages and deepening poverty. Um, so for many, this is not a new crisis. Um, it's an intensification of existing hardships and difficulties. And we know that inflation isn't felt the same by everyone. Um, so London's cost of living tracker is a new indicator as part of London's poverty profile and the tracker is available on our website, it's accompanied by a blog um, and we'll be putting a short video of today's webinar online and we'll be updating it on a quarterly basis and we want to develop it further. Uh, we know that lots of different organisations and agencies are tracking the impact of inflation, uh, taking both a qualitative and quantitative approach um, and we hope that uh, London's cost of living tracker will be an important contribution to the body of evidence um, about how the wider economic environment is impacting on people's lives um, and we also hope that it can provide a stepping off point for community organising work and a contribution to discussions about policy responses. Um, so uh, for today, the focus is on the methodology and then a run through of the data and key findings. So we've set this up as a short webinar of around 30 minutes and there'll be a sort of show and tell 20 minute presentation um, followed by Q&A. So please put your questions um, in the Q&A box. Uh, if you're happy to say who you are, then um, also tell us where you're from. Um, what we'll do at the end is read them out and, and try to respond to as many as we can. Um, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Nauko Skiada of WPI Economics. So thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah. OK, so um, yeah, I'm Nako Skiada. I'm a senior data insights consultant at WPI Economics. Uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, about the London cost of living tracker. I'm going to give an overview of what it is and what it measures, um, a brief outline of how we constructed it, um, a look at the most in insightful results with a focus on income and poverty, which is going to be the bulk of the presentation. And then I'll do a quick introduction online on uh, the web on Trust for London's uh, website. Uh, so first, a few words about WPI economics and who we are. Um, we are a very small consultancy. We're based in Westminster. We make an, we try to make an impact through um, economics that people understand, uh, data insights and policy consulting. And we work with uh, a lot of businesses, local and central government, SMEs and charities to help them deliver better social outcomes. Um, we focus on important social, uh, environmental and economic policy debates, uh, for instance, the futures of the green economy, productivity, growth, leveling up on mental health. And we are also very well known for our work in poverty and inequality, uh, for example, with uh, social metrics commissions where we developed uh, an analytical framework and analysis uh, to measure, to, to create a new measure for poverty. And of course, with uh, the Trust for London's uh, London Poverty Profile. Um, so uh, the cost of living tracker. Um, it was a way to measure how inflation has affected different types of households in London. 
so we looked at how much more households would have to spend now in order to be able to afford the same things in the same quantities um, as uh, three years ago. So before the cost of living crisis and the rises in inflation. Um, it is not a, a rate of inflation for households uh, because we know that households will probably will have adapted their expenditure in order to counteract the effects of inflation. But what it does, it gives us an idea of how much more households would have to spend in order to maintain a same standard of living um, and whether there are any differences between households in, in that. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly go through the methods. It's a bit complicated, so I'm going to try to explain it as, sim as simply as possible. Um, so uh, we used uh, the living costs and food survey in order to get the original spending, so our baseline expenditure data for households. This was uh, in the period of April 2017 to March uh, 2020. Uh, we chose this period, um, it's quite a long period, uh, we chose it because it incorporated three waves of the living costs and food survey, which gave us enough sample size. So the three waves uh, gave us a sample size of 16,000 households in the UK, uh, out of which uh, just over 1,500 were in London. Um, and we used data up to March 2020 because we didn't really want to use expenditure data that was collected during lockdown years, pandemic lockdown years. And that was for two reasons, partly because uh, the quality of the data may not be as good as other years, just because uh, field workers and interviewers weren't able to hold face-to-face -face interviews. Um, but also the expenditure patterns in that time were very, very different to how general expend to, to how we generally spend our money. We weren't able to spend money on restaurants, for instance, we weren't able to go out. So uh, we didn't feel that the expenditure in those years was representative of general expenditure patterns. Um, once we had that baseline expenditure, um, we added, uh, we used inflation, the CPIH inflation measure by the ONS. Uh, so we just uh, adjusted the prices by how much they had changed. And out the other side, uh, we have an estimate of how much these baskets um, in 2017 and to 2020, how much they would cost uh, with the current prices. Then when, once we had expenditure for its households for then and now, it was easy to just group households by the type of households we were interested in. So either by income, by poverty, by age, um, figure out what the expenditure for that group of households was back then, what the expenditure for the group of households is now, and what the percentage difference between the two is. So what we're looking at is that percentage differences between prices then and prices now. Um, of course, there were about a hundred items that we tracked that we looked at prices in. We had to somehow um, aggregate these to category to, to, to few categories, so we were able to look at differences. Uh, for those that know, uh, we use the same um, the same classification as uh, the CPI inflation CPIH inflation uses. So that's the COI co classification. At its highest level, the fewest categories are twelve categories. Um, we use these uh, 12 categories, but we disaggregated a couple of things that we wanted to look at in more detail. So we disaggregated energy bills and public transport. So we got a few more than uh, 12 categories in total. Uh, for this talk today, I'm going to be concentrating mostly on food and non-alcoholic beverages, rents and energy bills. Um, OK, so this is what we found. First of all, when we look at the difference in prices between 2020 and now, um, overall for all households in London, uh, all households in London have seen a 21% increase. So if they were to buy the same exact things as they did three years ago, if they were to buy them now, they would have to spend a fifth more um, in order to, do, to be able to do that. However, this is not um, the same across um, all households. Um, so first of all, if we look at households by income, broken down by income, and in this graph, um, the bars represent um, one, each bar is an income category. So on the left is the 20% of households with the lowest income, on the right, the 20% of households in the highest income, and the 20% of households in between. Uh, households in the lowest incomes 
have seen that that price rise um, in the basket of goods, original basket of goods and services, being 24 percent compared to only 20 percent uh, for households in the highest income. So what that means is that for the same basket of goods and services that households bought in 2020, um, lowest income households would have to spend um, a much higher proportion um, in order to buy the same things than uh, higher income households. Um, when we looked at households in poverty and not in poverty, however, we saw that the overall increase in that basket was more or less the same at about 21%. Um, this hides quite a lot of nuance, which we'll discuss um, in a bit. So why is that, why, why is the differential? Why is that, uh, why, why does this happen? Um, first of all, the overall inflation figure um, is an average of price changes in a variety of products and services. Um, products and services though, don't change at a constant or at the same rate. So for instance, we've seen uh, over the last couple of years that food and non-alcoholic beverages, as well as energy costs, have seen a very big and consistent increase in price, uh, whilst other items um, have seen lower increases or not as consistent. Um, at the same time, households differed in what they spend their money on. So these differences in household spending combined with how different products prices change determine how inflation is experienced by different households. Um, so these are a couple of examples of how this happens. Um, this graph uh, again looks at households broken down by income. On the top is the households, are the households in the lowest income quintile, and uh, on the bottom, the households in the highest income quintile. Um, the bars uh, represent 100% of the expenditure at the baseline period between 2017 and 2020. The colors represent different items. And the size of the colors uh, represent the proportion of that item, um, what the proportion of spending on that item was as a proportion of the whole expenditure. So for instance, for lower uh, income households, um, food and alcoholic beverage is represented by the purple rectangle. Um, they spend 17 57 pounds, which meant it was 17% of their overall expenditure. Um, whereas households in the highest income spend 78% on food and non-alcoholic beverages, although that only represented 8% of their income. And um, when we apply inflation prices, we saw before uh, in the first couple of slides that for lower income households, the overall um, increase in prices in the price of the basket uh, was 24%. Um, this, um, but there's the items, and, and for higher income households, the, the, the overall increase was 20%. However, you see from the colors here that um, different items have made different contributions to that overall increase. So, oops, sorry. For instance, um, energy has made an 8% 8 contribution uh, to the overall increase in the lower income household baskets, uh, whereas it's only made a 3% increase in the higher income households. And similarly, food and non-alcoholic uh, beverages have made a 5% increase uh, in the overall uh, increase for lower income households, but only 2% increase for higher income households. Um, and this is more striking when we look at households broken down by poverty. Um, so in their original expenditure in 2020, um, households in poverty spend about half of their total expenditure on food, rents, and energy. At the same time, households that were not in poverty spend only 23% of their overall expenditure in those three items. So, um, so the, the overall increase is very similar. Um, what the baseline that they start with is quite different. And this is the effect of inflation. So the overall increase is 21%. However, within that, um, 
households, 13% uh, of that increase for households in poverty comes from very, very basic essentials like energy, rents, and food, whereas only 8% increase for higher income households comes from those same essentials. Um, that means that for households in poverty, um, they will probably find it very difficult to adjust their spending in order to counteract uh, increasing prices. First of all, because there's just very, very little room to cut. It's very difficult to cut on essentials. It's very difficult to cut on things such as rent and energy. Um, and in terms of all the other expenses that may not be as essential, the proportion that they have to spend is very little. Um, so in summary, what we see is that there are big increases in everyone. Uh, for everyone, uh, we uh, depending on the households that people live in, the increases can be from 18% to up to 25%. However, uh, households on lower income have to increase their expenditure by a much higher proportion in order to maintain the same standard of living as they did before the rise in prices. And whilst households in poverty have seen similar rise in prices overall to those not in poverty, their ability to adapt to current and future price rises is limited because they spend a much higher proportion on essential items who, that have also seen a much bigger inflation. Um, this is important to understand. It's important to understand where the pressures come for different types of households. But we also, it's from a kind of like from a higher from a different perspective, it's um, it's uh, it's it's important to see that differences in spending um, how they affect households as well. So we normally analyze outcomes uh, from an income perspective in terms of how much households make, but this analysis shows us that changes in spending also affect groups to a great extent. And maybe it's something that we should be taking into account because we, it might allow us to focus policy and support um, to those most in need. Um, yeah, so this is a very, very, very quick roundup of the tracker and uh, a very, very brief um, dip into the insights that we that we drew from it. As Rebecca said, the tracker will be developed over time um, and will be extended to different demographic groups. Um, and we will be updating it uh, quarterly with um, new inflation, inflation data. Um, so I would also like to um, quickly show you um, how that looks on the website. There's a lot more information. Um, okay, so uh, this is the cost of living, London's cost of living tracker page. Um, we have split, we have organized um, the results. Uh, first of all, we look at the tracker. So these are the overall uh, percentage rises between baseline and now. Uh, then we look at the household expenditure before the pandemic and the impact that the inflation has had. And we have um, the, our data and methods in more detail here. Um, in order to get to different demographics groups, you can use um, the drop-down menu. Um, at the moment, we have income quintiles, we have age and we have households in poverty and not in poverty. Uh, and the same happens uh, when you wanna look at uh, either the pre-pandemic household expenditure and the impact of inflation. You can navigate through different groups um, using this drop-down menu. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I don't know if Rebecca, you wanna say something else about the website? No, I think that that's a, that was a great introduction. Thanks, um, Naoko. Um, I can see we've got one question in the Q&A, so um, uh, I'll read it out for you. What are the monetary figures for the different household income quintiles? Just thinking that London has uh, such high inequality that these numbers may differ significantly. Um, so I'm guessing, uh, sorry, what was the question again? The monetary... Monetary figures for the different household income quintiles. Uh, so the cutoff points for the different incomes or how much they spend, I'm not quite sure. Um, so in terms of how much they spend, um, I don't so know. If 
we'll, we'll some of the add some of those in the charts that can be linked uh yeah, some sure. of that accessible on the website okay so these are the um the figures that we have for the original expenditure for 2017 to 2020 um, so these in total, so these are the actual figures. Um, so in total in 2017, 2020, the total expenditure for households in the lowest quintile was 335 pounds per week on average. And this compares to 965 pounds per week on average for higher income households. Um, and there's obviously very different, um, very big differences on things like rent, for instance. Uh, lower income households spend on average about 60 pounds a week on rents, higher income households 113, but um, differences in uh, food, for instance, 57 for lower income households and 78 for higher income households, but also differences in things that I didn't quite discuss um, at the presentation, but uh, things like restaurants and hotels, you can see here, that there's a big differential in terms of actual prices. However, when we look at how much that represents in terms of total income, these tend to uh, switch over. So um, even though uh, lo uh, lower income households spend a much smaller amount of actual money, it, it, it's a much bigger proportion of their overall, overall expense, if that makes sense. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Could um could you tell us a bit more about the um so you've talked about income quintiles, but just took us through the um age um sure. data on age that'd be really helpful. Um okay, so starting from the beginning. So um this is, uh, these are the change in prices over time from 2020 to February, 2023, the latest inflation figures. Uh, the four lines represent uh, four age groups, uh, 20 to 35, 35 to 50, 50, 65, and over 65. Um, from that, we see that overall, uh, youngest, younger households have seen a lower uh, increase in prices in the price of their basket compared to higher uh, to um, older households um, and that's um, get there so but that is again it's a it becomes a bit more nuanced once you look at um, at what why that happens so in terms of their expenses um, Low, um, younger households spend a lot more than older households, uh, but there's a huge difference in how much their housing costs. So rents for, for younger households were averaged about £210 per week compared to only £20 for older households. And even if we take into account that older households probably uh, a lot more uh, people in older households own their homes. Even if we take um, all of that combined, again, the difference is huge. So if you look at like the red and the pink here, these are all expenses having to do with houses. And for younger households, these are really, really huge and a very, very big proportion of their overall expenditure, as you can see here. Uh, at the same time, um, older households spend a lot more money on energy compared to younger households. Um, and also energy is a much bigger proportion um, of their overall expenditure. So when it comes to, um, um, to the impact that inflation has had, um, <clears throat> again, older households, um, the contribution that energy rises have made to the overall increase in the price of their baskets is very, very big compared to younger households. Uh, but also things such as uh, food um, is, is quite big. At the same time, uh, they also spend a lot more on recreation and culture, which is probably a good thing. Um, uh, but in terms of housing, again, the squeeze is very much on the younger households. They, that, that house, generally household costs 
like rents and other household costs um, uh, have made a much bigger contribution for younger households than older households. Great, thank you. And um, there's two questions that have come in. Um, first one is from Michael Edwards. We've, we've already talked a little bit about housing costs, but his question is, can you expand a bit on housing costs? Are those who own homes such as paying mortgages or imputed rents, as in ONS? So I, I guess just sort of explaining a little bit more about, about what's included there. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a bit problematic. So uh, the CPIH, which uh, which is the Consumer Prices Index, including owner-occupier occupy, costs, um, they don't directly track uh, homeowner costs. They impute these costs um, and they base the imputation on rents. Um, it's debatable how true to the actual, I mean, I suppose it's the best method that can be found, um, but yeah, it is. A, it, it could be a bit, I'm, I'm not, we're not sure exactly what we're measuring and what the different, what the inflation measures there. Okay. Also, uh, since September, we've had um, quite a high uh, rise in interest rates for mortgage, for people who have mortgages. So that also, uh, I suppose uh, it is, in part uh, reflected in CPIH figures, but we haven't really done a direct um, increase in mortgage costs for that. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the, answered the question. It is, but it is like, so all the increases are through CPIH. We haven't done any other adjustments ourselves. Okay, thank you. Um, and then on, on to next uh, question from uh, Maya Alexander from Ministry of Stories. Uh, Maya's asking, is there a category within the expenditure groups which links to extracurricular activities? Um, I can see there's an education related expenses group. So just wondering as working at a children's charity and would like to build on the impact on children's lives. Uh, there are, uh, off the top of my head, I have to say, I don't remember them exactly, but yeah, the education related, education -related activities will have some, ex some extracurricular activities and costs related to education. Uh, so maybe field trips with the school and things like that. Um, we haven't extracted them, but um, yeah, it's not something that we're planning to do anytime soon, but it, yeah, the data do exist for these types of uh, activities. Maybe not in too much detail, but it depends what they want to get out of it. Okay, great. Well, that, well, that brings us up to almost um, three o'clock. So uh, thank you um, to everyone for joining us. We'll be sending out a feedback form um, afterwards. So if you've got any follow-up questions or um, any feedback or, or suggestions, we'd be really happy um, uh, to hear from you. Um, so uh, thanks to Nauco and, and thanks to Guy as well. Um, so uh, yeah, have, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.